From Hollywood, it's time now for... Johnny Dollar. This is Carol, Johnny. Oh, hello, Carol. I've made the arrangements for us to go to the seance tonight with Madame Morgana Morgana. Good. What time? Eight o'clock. Only it's across the river in New Jersey. Will you have dinner with me? I'd love to. But we'd better make it pretty early. Pick you up in your penthouse at six? I'll be waiting, Johnny. <laughs> Tonight, and every weekday night, Bob Bailey and the transcribed adventures of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. (laughs) Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar, location New York City. To the Universal Adjustment Bureau, Hartford, Connecticut. Following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the matter of the medium. Well done. Some pretty strong pressure was being put on Carol Sharp to change the beneficiaries of her $110,000 life policy. And she was very much under the influence of a psychic medium who insisted that she be named as one of the two new beneficiaries. The other was to be a Tony Ricardo, whose father made quite a record for himself in the bootlegging gangster days of the Roaring Twenties. I met him at Susan Palmer's Oyster Bar over in Radio City. I must admit I was surprised at the sort of fellow he turned out to be. I guess it was a little, well, extreme to threaten you that way, Mr. Dollar. That's putting it mildly. But this whole spiritualism business and the hold it has on Carol, well, it has me terribly concerned. You don't like spiritualism? I didn't say that. You know, just as well as I do, there are a great many fine, honest spiritualists in the city. But as in any other field, there are frauds, racketeers... So I've heard. It's not only true of religions, but businesses, professions, anything, you know. Sure, sure. But now look here, Tony. Dollar, I will not have you or anyone else leading Carol on. This medium who's already has such a hold on her. Do you understand? Pardon me, Tony. Your background is showing. What? I say come off it. This kind of act won't work. What are you talking about? Do you think I don't know you're one of the two Carol wants to name as beneficiaries of her policy? You and that medium? That's not my doing. Whose doing is it? That medium, Morgana Morgana. Been taking Carol's money by the hundreds week after week. Now you've come along to encourage her, and Della, I tell you to stop it. Tony. Maybe that story you gave her about dreaming of her over and over when you were a kid and couldn't even have known about it was true, but I don't believe it. Tony, that. that was made up out of whole cloth. I still... What? This funny decision to switch your policy around is the case I'm assigned to. Wait a minute, you mean that... Yes. I had to meet her somehow, so I used that device, knowing she might fall for it because of her implicit belief in such things. Yes, but now you're encouraging this whole thing. You're even going to see this Morgana Morgana with her tonight. Because if she is a phony, it's the only way I can show this to Carol. Well, I hope and pray that you can, Mr. Dollar. Some of the best psychic investigators in the country have been stumped by her. How are you going to go about it? I won't know until I've seen her operate. Even then, I may not know. Or maybe this medium isn't a fraud. Oh, come on, of course she is. But you can't prove it. But you or somebody must. Carol will change her policy and... And And then turn up dead. Won't be easy, Mr. Dollar. I've attended these seances with Carol, many of them. There have been times when I've almost been convinced myself. Waiter. Waiter, some more coffee, please. No, no, no more for me, thanks. You're going to need it, Tony, because I'm going to keep you here until you've told me every detail you can remember of this Madame Morgana Morgana seance procedure. All right, I'll help you all I can. You'd better. I'm still not forgetting that if I fall down on this job, you'll cut into Carol's insurance for a neat $30,000, in spite of your sweet talk. I'll say this for Tony Ricardo. He was thorough. And I began to believe that he was serious in his concern for Carol. Item 12, 10 cents, one fold call to Tommy Green. No, no, Johnny, no trouble at all in getting the rundown on Carol's family that you asked for. Keep talking. Apparently, they're doing all right there in Mochunk, PA. Uh, neither the mother or two brothers will ever have to really get out and dig for a living. Their old man left them well set up, huh? Yeah. Uh, one of the boys, Harold's, turned out pretty well. Works in some office over there, even though he doesn't really need to. What about the other boy? That'll be Dave, the black sheep of the family. Travels with a fast crowd, tears around the country in a sports car, that sort of thing. Oh. Right now, he's somewhere here in New York, just playing around. But, uh, Johnny, are you getting anywhere on this case? Yeah, Tommy, I think I am. Especially after what you just told me. Huh? Item 13, another phone call. This time to Sergeant Randy Singer at 18th Precinct Headquarters. Yeah, Johnny? Got a real easy one for you. What's that? Find a man. Name is David Sharp. Home address, Mock Chunk, Pennsylvania. 
Chunk, Pennsylvania. Got it. Description? None, though he's probably in his 20s. Well, that's not and enough. And he's probably staying at a hotel here in the city. Well, yeah, but where? What part of the city? Let me know when you find out, will you? Yeah, now, wait a minute, Kate. Expense account item 14, $106.80, and it includes cabs to several camera shops. One miniature camera with an F2 lens, a couple of rolls of special film, some very special flash bulbs, and a tiny flash holder. Item 15, taxi back to the towers to clean up and dress for my date with Carol. Then the phone rang. Johnny Deller. We located David Sharp for you, Johnny. Just dumb luck. Now, who knows, Randy? Maybe you're psychic. Nah, leave us not have that stuff. Where is he? Found him staying at the third hotel we called, the Aberan over on East 53rd Street. Not two blocks from that palatial joint where you're staying. Is he there now? No, but he always comes in just before dinner time. Hey, you still haven't told me why you're interested in him. I'm not sure myself, but do me a favor, will you? Like what? When he shows up, put a tail on him. I want to know where he goes, how long he stays, and when he comes back. But you won't say why? Not until I'm sure I know why. Thanks, Randy. Yeah, but I haven't said Thanks, I... boy. Dinner with Carol could have been one of the pleasantest things in years. But I'm afraid I was preoccupied with matters at hand and she with anticipation. She's promised to try to hear from Daddy again tonight. Oh, Johnny, I so want to speak to him again. Finally, I signed the check. We hopped into a taxi and headed across the river to the Jersey side. We ended up at a rather plain but nice home somewhere on the outskirts of, I guess, it's Union City. We were met at the door by a matron of about 45, I should say, who looked like an ordinary, respectable housewife, except perhaps for her quick, discerning eyes. Good evening, Carol, my dear. Oh, and you must be Mr. Johnny Dollar. Yes, uh, Madam Morgana Morgana. Yes. Do come in and meet the others who are here to form the circle tonight. Thank you, Carol. Thank you. Carol told me nothing about you except your veridical dreams of her. An amazing experience, isn't it? Perhaps you're really psychic. Oh, I, I doubt that. But all our friends thought my kid brother Richard was before he died a couple of years ago. Richard. Richard. That name has been haunting me ever since Carol telephoned. You don't suppose... What, madame? Oh, no, of course not. Now, um, here in the parlor are the others who will be with us tonight. Uh, may I present Mr. Johnny Dollar, Mrs. Dorothy Jessup... How do you do? Mr. John Price... Hello. Mr. Samuel Froelich. Right. And, of course, you all know Carol Sharp. Good evening. I see no reason why we shouldn't start. The atmosphere has seemed almost electric tonight. Very conducive to good contact with the, shall we say, the netherworld. And, oh, oh, yes, you may smoke if you like, Mr. Dollar. We're very informal. Hmm? Oh, I'm sorry. Just sort of a nervous habit, I guess, flicking this lighter. Oh, um, incidentally, I... I hope you tell these people of your dreams after we're finished. <sighs> oh, dear. The atmosphere is tense. We should begin right away. Well, yes, I'll... I'll, I'll turn on some low music. The six of us sat down in a small circle. On the floor were three long, slender metal trumpets, like Halloween horns, but made of thin metal, spaced about the center of the circle. In the subdued conversation of the next few minutes, I learned it was through these that the spirit voices would come to us, that they would rise in the air and the voices would issue from them. From time to time, there in the pitch-black room, I snapped the cap of my lighter as a reminder of what it was. You mustn't light it, Johnny, you know. No danger. This one hasn't even got a flint in it. I do hope we get some messages tonight. I think we will, Mr. Froelich. I have a feeling that we will. I have that feeling, too. Very strongly. From what Madame told us, you must have definite psychic powers, Mr. Dollar. That should be helpful. Wait. Wait. The power's here. I feel it. Almost as though she were suffering Come physical to us. pain. We are ready. The medium sighed and gasped. And we waited and waited. <sighs> It's hard to describe the tension that comes of waiting that way in a completely darkened room. And it's easy to see how well the imagination can work, the powers of suggestion. There was a slight sound. One of the trumpets. I heard it move. Yes. Yes, so did I. That means that they are with us. It seemed to move toward you, Carol. I, I hope so. Yes, I can feel it in the air near me. Father? 
Father? Carol. Carol. Oh, Father, can you speak to me? There's so many things I wish to ask you. Yes, dear. Yes. Yes. It may not sound like much to tell, but believe me, this was impressive. The death-like silence broken only by the faint voice from the trumpet, the whispered questions by Carol, an occasional sigh from the medium, and the shutter of my special little camera, which I hope sounded enough like my lighter had sounded. Yes, Carol. Always do the things I tell you to. You are a good girl, my darling. And you give me great happiness in this lonely, in this... Father? Father? Goodbye, my... Goodbye. Mm -hmm. Oh, Johnny, do you see? Do you see? Because only he and I know the things we talked about. Wait. I feel the trumpet is still near us, and John. perhaps... John. John. Mr. Dollar, it's for you. Yes? Richard? Yes, John. Dick. I've waited so long to speak to you. Dick. My brother. The brief conversation I carried on with my dead brother Richard was amazing. Of things in my childhood that I thought nobody else even knew about. Personal, intimate things that can only be known to a brother or someone equally close. It was fantastic, amazing, awe-inspiring. Except for one thing. I never had a brother. I didn't tell this to anyone. I played it straight and even stayed around and discussed my trumped-up dreams after the seance. But I needed proof, and I couldn't wait to get back to New York to the police lab where I could develop the infrared film in my little camera. Now, here's our star to tell you about the final intriguing episode of this week's story. Tomorrow, the wind-up. And a bit of heartbreak for a very chastened girl. Join us, won't you? Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Bob Bailey, is transcribed in Hollywood. It is produced and directed by Jack Johnstone, who also wrote tonight's story. Be sure to join us tomorrow night, same time and station, for the next exciting episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Roy Rowan speaking. <laughs> <laughs>